And thus the secret is revealed. Lauren is the true head of the Sheba clan. She was kept a secret in order to devote her life to learning the sealing power without fear of being attacked. Jaden got to play decoy, with everyone assuming he was the true Red Ranger. Jaden had to do one of the hardest things in the whole world. Hide it from his best friends. Yeah, about that, um, why did he have to hide it from them? See, I understand hiding it from the Nylock, maybe even going so far as to play up the secrecy, especially in light of that spy in Antonia's introduction episode, but really, that was an isolated incident. There was really no pressing reason he had to deceive them. It's not like they were gonna blab about it in the middle of a battle. And here's where things kind of fall apart again. See, everybody on the team accepts this as necessary and is not mad at Jaden for the deception. They're just happy Lauren has mastered the symbol power and is ready. The weak link here is Jaden. Now, of course, they can't both be the Red Ranger. We saw what happened the last time there were two of the same Ranger back in Dino Thunder. The morphing grid can't handle two of the exact same power. But see, while she needs to be the Red Ranger in order to defeat Xandred... Lauren, you... No, we can't be together now. You are now the Red Ranger. You must take your place as their leader. The only way for that to happen is for me to leave. Um, why? Why do you have to leave? You can still train the others, still act in a support position. Hell, it might be smart for her to start training you in the ceiling power too, just in case something happens to her. It's good to have a backup is what I'm saying. They're too loyal to me. If I stay, if I stay, dangerous mistakes could be made. How? Well, we'll see in a bit. The next day at the welcome party for Lauren, where we also see that her morpher is actually the Sentai version with the brush, but whatever. And we see she's getting the character development that I thought should have gone to Jaden. This belonged to my father. He used it in his last battle. Jaden decides to leave right in the middle of the party, which of course is the worst way of doing this since it alienates the others to her. Everyone calls bullcrap on this, and I just realized an even bigger problem with this departure. This place is his home! Where the hell is he going to go? That night, of course, nobody ate the prop cake. Somehow, fighting next to him made me a stronger warrior. So, what are we supposed to do? Just forget about him like he never existed? Of course not. Well, he's my best friend. So? I'm going after him. I'm sorry, Lauren. I'm sure you're a great samurai, but it's just not the same without Jaden. You really gotta feel sorry for this poor actress. I mean, she is acting the hell out of her scenes. There isn't much given to the character, but you can read a lot just by her body language and facial expressions. This woman deserves a better friggin' series because she's giving it her all. She is acting like someone who has been training in secret all her life, observing the others while not being able to interact with them, and she's understandably nervous as all hell about everything that's going down. I thought of you often over the years. I imagine that, like me, you, you must have felt very alone. I hope I can become part of the family now, too. You, me, surrounded by friends. This would be so much easier if it was like in Time Force with the Wes and Alex dynamic. If Lauren was full of herself, an utter jerk, or just screwed up the team with crappy orders and causing problems for them because she hasn't been there since the start. But she isn't! This poor kind woman is just trying to fulfill her destiny and make friends, and these assholes don't give a damn about her feelings! Yeah, they're friendly enough, but all they can do for this and the next two episodes is talk about how much they miss Jaden, how much things were better with him around, how much they want Jaden back. This is all in spite of the fact that Lauren does nothing differently than Jaden has been doing. They're not even trying to make her feel welcome. They barely talk to her at all! And Jaden's departure is so bizarre. At first I thought it might be because of exactly what's going on at the Sheba house, that his presence is a distraction for them, with their entire focus being about him instead of actually getting on with the mission. However, in a later episode, he says it's because he lied to them. Um, what? 
Nobody has expressed in any way that they're pissed at you for the deception. You are fabricating a conflict that does not exist. The Rangers would not keep comparing her to Jaden, wouldn't keep being focused on Jaden if he hadn't left. The next episode is The Great Duel, and as you can imagine with a title like that, it's about the final fight with Decker. By the by, despite his insistence that he isn't the Red Ranger, he's still carrying around his spin sword. And his morpher. Huh. The other rangers want to go off in search of Jaden, but G reminds them that Lauren needs them and they have a responsibility to help her. He goes off in their stead, interrupting the battle between him and Decker. The two end up falling over a cliff, both surviving and having themselves a little moment. Well, we completed our part of your father's plan. Yes, and we did it well. You're a wonderful mentor, G. <laughs> No, he isn't. But I'll save that for the character section. G talks about how proud he is of him and how he is the Red Ranger, but Jaden says he needs to finish off Decker once and for all. And then G walks off, having accomplished nothing. And the Great Duel turns out not to be the Great Duel, since it continues into the next episode, Evil Reborn. Also, Decker has a horse now for some reason. The other rangers, yet again, want to go and stop the fight with Decker, although Kevin stays behind with Lauren. I hate to split up the team, but this way Lauren can continue mastering the ceiling power while you help Jaden. Um, she already mastered it. That was the entire reason she came when she did. Later, Lauren can tell he wants to go and look for Jaden too, but he reaffirms that he has a duty to her and the city. You're all very lucky to have each other. I've never had a good friend. Now you do. Now let's go train. Yes, yeah, such a good friend you are, Kevin. Training separately from her, you dick. Back at the duel, things explode for no reason. Oh god, I'm having callous explosion flashbacks! The duel lasts into the night, seemingly ending with Decker's destruction. Back at the command house, Lauren finally just tells Kevin to go and help the others with Jaden. Besides, I'm worried about Jaden, too. He's my brother. Gee, it's almost like Jaden leaving caused more issues with people worrying about him than if he had just friggin' stayed! Back at the duel... I fell into a burning ring of fire. Jaden thinks it's over, but Decker is still trying to get back up and duel. The other rangers arrive, begging them to stop, but of course Decker keeps coming. Dayu contacts him telepathically, or maybe he's just crazy, either option works, and assumes her human form. I don't want to lose you again. But he just asks her to let him go, and he raises his sword to kill Jaden. However... <laughs> you know, much as I disliked the whole Decker arc just because of how completely pointless it felt, this was a twist I did not see coming. So... Kudos. At last, I'm free. And now you shall be reborn in primary village, Deckermon. Dayu, sensing Decker's death, starts planning a new sad tune on her harmonium, hoping it will finally bring Master Xandrid back from the river. Also, the rangers apparently decided to camp out there all night after Decker was defeated. So what does Jaden have to say? I'm sorry I couldn't share my secret. Lauren and the plan had to be protected. Nobody cared about that, you dumbass! Even they say it! We don't care that you kept your secret from us. I'm not who you thought I was. You're telling me we didn't know the man we trusted to lead the team? If you think everything our team has done isn't real just because you kept the secret, then say it to our faces. Exactly! It's ridiculous! So why the hell did you write it that way? The Jaden worship even feels especially off near the end, when, in much the same way Luke asked Leia in Return of the Jedi about their mother, Lauren asks Antonio about what Jaden was like as a kid, since she didn't get to have that much time with him. It would be a fine moment, except it's all about how awesome Jaden is, and how everyone wants to friggin' marry him, even featuring stock footage of the awful child actors. No wonder everyone follows it. Mm. Oh, no, you're cool too. I've seen you in action. You? You're just as good. <laughs> Up yours, Ako! So yeah, Jaden rejoins the team, showing how he can be a part of it, even if he isn't morphed, slicing up Moogers. Dayu starts playing her new tune, which sounds very much like her old tune. 
Decker is gone. I've been deluding myself for centuries thinking we could ever be reunited. If I can't be happy, why should anyone else be? You're a Final Fantasy villain, aren't you, Dayu? Maya runs into Dayu on the coast and slices her and the harmonium. <laughs> why are you laughing? <laughs> its destruction will unleash a cloud of pure magnificent misery, and Master Zandred will rise again. I always knew acoustic guitars would be our undoing. The release of Misery goes straight into the Sanzu River and awakens Master Zandred, bringing him to Earth. And thus we head into our penultimate episode, The Ceiling Symbol. Once again, I think you can infer what this episode is about. Yes, Mia's cooking. Dayu, dying, admits that her heart remained human even while a Nylock, which Master Zandred believes can be of use to him. Go be with Decker if you like. Huh? Hey! He finishes her off, seeming to absorb part of her into him. Lauren arrives and explains that she needs the others to distract Master Zandred while she writes the ceiling symbol, since it takes time to write. And the Rangers serve as a great distraction as they get smacked like flies the whole way through. Lauren starts writing out the seal, and it is visibly impressive compared to the other symbol power we've seen, so kudos there. Everything I've ever done has been for this one moment. I must succeed. This is for you, Father. Jaden also comes in to help, just as Lauren launches the ceiling symbol at Master Zandred. <laughs> did it, Father. I finally sealed Master Zandred. Oh, that can't be good. Dayu's human side is what saved me. He must have absorbed Dayu's body. He's not pure Nylock anymore. Zandred lets loose his full fury, forcing Jaden to use a teleportation symbol power to get everyone to safety. Zandred returns to the Netherworld to complete his plans. The Rangers are naturally crestfallen, wondering if they can even win. I feel so sorry for Lauren. She spent her whole life learning the ceiling symbol. And it was all for nothing. Yeah, it's a pity you guys aren't going to comfort her or anything! God, you suck! Lauren and Jaden watch the stars, also realizing how screwed they are. I let everybody down, Jaden. You, the Rangers, and especially Dad. She hands leadership back over to him since she came here to seal Zandred, but that task is over now. Of course, nobody actually bothers to offer reassurances to her that it wasn't her fault, she did everything right. No, 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 Jaden's back, so let's hear his pep talk. Master Zandred is more powerful than ever. It appears that he's unbeatable. But I have a plan. We're gonna take him out with brute force. <laughs> that is the most real authentic, hysterical laugh of my entire life because that is not a plan. It's barely a concept. To be fair, there is more to the idea. Basically, he reasons that merging with Dayu may have given him some advantages, but it also created a nice big weak spot to target for massive damage. And Lauren's final contribution, since she was injured in that last battle, is the Sheba Fire Disc, aka yet another power-up. Ugh. God, I hope Megaforce doesn't have so many power-ups. All right, I've seen Megaforce. Ugh. Anyway, the Sheba Fire Disc is loaded with every bit of symbol power she has. The next day, the gaps open wide and the Sanzu River floods into the city, Master Zandred riding his boat into the flow and a Mugur army coming along for the ride. By the by, in an earlier episode where they faced a Mugur army, they had the good sense to actually use the Samurai Battle Wing to strafe them and take out a good chunk from the air. Unfortunately, this is Power Rangers and nobody has any collective memory, so that isn't tried. You still happy you decided to become a Samurai? Are you serious? Being a ranger is the best thing that ever happened to me. <laughs> I wouldn't trade it for anything. Zandred himself joins the fray, and the team storms through the army, the other rangers holding off the Moogers until Jaden can strike the weak spot. And it doesn't work. The Sheba fire disc shatters, and the rangers are blasted back. When the rangers refuse to beg for mercy, Zandred declares that he'll go after Lauren to make them beg. And thus bringing us to our finale, Samurai Forever. After a full two minutes of recapping the previous episode, and another minute for the theme song, the rangers force themselves up to go in pursuit of Zandred. What we do today will be remembered forever. 
back at the command house, Lauren is working on a new fire disc, though it takes everything out of her. Yay! So the first fire disc was pointless. One thing I'll definitely credit this finale here, pretty much the entire episode is one big fight scene, but I appreciate that we've got this Battle of the Rangers doing this unmorphed. Samurai in general did a lot better with the unmorphed fights than many Disney seasons. It wasn't frequent, but seeing them train a lot certainly helped too. Anyway, G arrives to give them the new fire disc. And after that, you're gonna teach me something new. What's that? To ride your motorcycle. Now that scares me more than any Nighthawk. <laughs> He also gives Jaden one other disc, one that belonged to his father and can seemingly double his power. And so, more sword fighting, the rangers more, fight Xandrid more, fight, 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 double disc used, and Jaden once again goes for the soft spot. Sheba fire disc used by Kevin to strike it, then Jaden assumes Shogun mode outside of the Megazord, basically using it like a battleizer and just repeatedly striking the spot. The good news is that it works and Xandrid explodes. The problem is that Xandred is a Nylock, which means that when he dies the first time, he goes big. The Rangers summon the Gigazord, but he blasts them away. Kevin is ready to use some symbol power to buy them some time, but Jaden stops him. We have to demorph and combine every last ounce of our symbol power into one grand strike. What? We can only beat him as a team. What if we miss? We have to get so close that we can't miss. And since everything is riding on this one attack, they have to keep charging even if all they have left is one Zord. Which quickly starts happening. Each shot from Xandrid blasts away more Zords until they get in close. I just want to say that no Red Ranger has ever led a better team of samurai. I'm honored to have fought beside you and to call you my friends. And at point-blank range, they unleash all of their symbol power into one final strike that cuts him down. Xandrid, being a dick, tries to take them with him. Octoru, the only survivor, is sent back to the netherworld along with all the Sanzu river water. The rangers, of course, survive and reunite with G. Samurai Rangers, victory is ours! <laughs> And let's say goodbye to our heroes, shall we? Well, we had quite a time, didn't we, Spike? Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Skull arrives in a limousine to pick up Spike. Skull! You. You look great! You look... <laughs> you haven't changed a bit. <laughs> Neither have you, Skullovich. Back at the command house, Lauren is leaving for some reason. I'm guessing to get her stuff so she can move back into her own damn house. Don't you want to say goodbye to the others? I'm not very good at goodbyes or hellos sometimes. Besides, they just find some way of talking about how fantabulous Jaden is. The other rangers are heading out too. I have scored the golden ticket. An around the world fishing expedition. I'm going to the culinary academy. Thank you. Well, no comments, please. <laughs> well, I just caught up with my coach the other day and I just barely have enough time to train for the Olympic qualifying tournament. I'm just excited I get to go home and take care of my sister. There's no other place I'd rather be than home with family. Kinda thought I'd go with Emily. Yeah, it's really been great seeing your relationship develop over the series, like how you two, um, uh, uh well, Scott said she was into you, so that's something. And Jaden and G? For the first time in my life, I'm done with my samurai duties. For now, anyway. Shiba House must always be ready for the next Nalok attack. Even if it never comes. I got you a little victory gift. <laughs> Jaden and G can play the guitar? What? <laughs> nice. <laughs> Like I said at the start, Samurai is not very good. I will admit, it is actually a lot better on my rewatch than it was when I was watching it as it aired. I think there is a bit more serialization in this one than we realized at the time, because it was stretched out over such a long period. Plus, reevaluation of the series has been done, although a lot of people at the time decried it as the worst of the show, even claiming that it killed Power Rangers. I don't agree, of course. It is by no means perfect, but it is not without merit. The biggest problem, as I discussed at the beginning, is the simple fact that a lot of this is apparently a note-for-note -note adaptation of the Sentai. 
and it shows. For me, at least, it has lots of elements that could have made it a new classic, but they weren't utilized, either because of lack of time or just being out of the game for so long that they didn't know how to use them. The finale is less than satisfying when you realize it's just fight after fight of brute force until they finally win, but at least there's some sentiment with the cast interactions, because with the rewatch, I actually did feel more like these people were friends and close to each other by the end. The first stumbling block was the villains. It seemed like there was an effort to create more complex villains with Dayu and Decker, who I've heard did not have as sympathetic a backstory in the Sentai, with the Faustian bargain. But here's the problem. They don't really do anything with it. There is no redemption arc for Dayu or Decker. They do still have their own subplots, but we have very little reason to care. What happened to them sucks, but in Dayu's case, she refuses to entertain the notion of ever being human again, and in Decker's case, we never know why exactly being half Nylock sucks so much. He calls it a cursed existence, but what does that mean? He's able to go to human form just fine. The strong implication is that his sword compels him to fight, but he loses the sword at the end of the first season and then takes great pains to get it back. Dayu's suffering at least ended up having an effect on the overall plot, but it was hard to feel sympathy for her situation when she never did anything about her issues with Decker. She kept pining for Decker to remember his memories and never bothered to just tell him. Why do I get the feeling their marriage wasn't gonna work out anyway? Here's the thing about irredeemable villains. If you're not gonna give them an arc, you need to at least make them cool enough that you don't mind that they're still evil, especially if you can make them threatening. And quite frankly, Master Xandred, while threatening at the end, spent most of the series whining and not doing anything. His voice sucked. He had no complex plans of his own, and at one point, even Octoroo said his plans were stagnant, and he only became intimidating when he actually got involved in the plot. Speaking of, Octoroo, useless. He sometimes had this rhyming quirk with how he talked, and sometimes he didn't. The writers couldn't seem to make up their minds on it. He wasn't as annoying as other villains, but he was just there, never actually contributing anything useful. The Mooger's design is okay. I love the Lovecraftian design of the heads. No eyes, all mouth. Although the clothing kind of ruins it a bit, the mustardy yellow really doesn't look good on them and makes them look bulkier. On to our heroes. Mentor G is one of the blandest, least interesting, rather dickish mentors we've seen in a while. We know nothing about him, about his backstory, about what makes him so damn qualified to be the mentor, why he doesn't have a first name or a last name, which goes to show the poor quality of his leadership, if he even is the leader, since Jaden is supposed to be the leader. But then what the hell is G supposed to be? Just a teacher? He's best at combat and symbol training. That's it. His attempts at mentoring are, for the most part, pretty piss poor. Here are some examples from various episodes. Day off. You need to find balance in your life because you push yourself too hard. Later lesson in the same episode. Oh, it's not about that. It's about believing in yourself by pushing yourself harder. I've got a spell on blue. Thinking the team is talking about Jaden when they're talking about Kevin, showing clear favoritism that's never addressed. Forest for the trees. He demands Mike's Samurizer be handed to him when he tries to use the beetle disc in a moment of weakness. No harm was actually done by doing so, mistake as it was, but G was out of line, claiming he wasn't ready to be a samurai despite several previous victories. Overreact much? At least in that episode, he admitted his style was too harsh. Jaden's challenge. I must give Jaden room to find the strength he needs to lead this team. Um, no, asshole. The team leader just walked out on his team instead of explaining matters to them and cares too much to let them fight alongside him. You need to smack him upside the head and get a clue. Room for one more. My aforementioned rant about G taking away Antonio's morpher. At least he admits later how wrong he was in The Rescue. Something fishy. The lousy and quite frankly awful way in which he solves Antonio's PTSD, which basically boils down to, get over it, you whiny crybaby. Thanks, Power Rangers. Thanks for continuing to prove that you are often less sophisticated than a cartoon about lesbian space rocks. It's especially annoying with him when they keep calling him Mentor as if it was his first name. It's awkward every single time. His character is... He rides a motorcycle. 
I get the impression we're supposed to believe he had some rebellious youth given his guitar skills in the final episode and the motorcycle, but it's all conjecture. His character is tied in with Jaden, which we have to talk about. Really, the arc of the series is about Jaden having to accept the whole team thing, which finally happens in the last episode when they all deliver the final blow to Xandra together. Sure, they all contributed to the other blows during the last fight, but it was only all of them striking together that did the job. Throughout the season, he continually talks a big game about being a team, but in reality, his constant fear of everyone else getting hurt makes him want to deal with everything himself. He doesn't trust them to take care of themselves, nor does he inspire them to think of their own well-being, instead making them more worried about his well-being by his frankly boneheaded actions. He goes out on his own to fight a Nylock that's poisoned him and the others, despite being an incredible pain. In Trust Me, Decker says that Jaden's weak because of his friends, and he buys it, running off half-cocked and injured, even though this is midway through the second season, and even letting it affect him in The Master Returns. As I stated earlier, he was absolutely right that everyone would care more about him than the mission, but that's only because he stupidly put himself in all of their minds during a point when they were trying to celebrate Lauren. And in my tireless effort to read too much into this stuff, I must bring up the ranger's psychoses again as a result of this shared destiny. When he leaves, he admits he doesn't know who he is anymore because he's wrapped up his entire friggin' life into this crap. I feel that what would have been stronger for both G and Jaden, quite frankly, was if we had a bit of daddy issues. As I suggested at the beginning, there's plenty of room for abandonment issues, not only from his own father, but of his sister too. G essentially served as his father, which leads me to believe that what we really needed between these two was a you're not my real dad moment, something to make Jaden and G argue, because they never do. Not a single disagreement or raised voice between the two. The worst it gets is when Jaden pushes himself too hard training, but G keeps saying he has to give Jaden freedom. Yeah, freedom, after he's lived for nothing else. There should be more resentment there, more regret and sorrow for everything he knows he doesn't have. And yet all the character development he should have gotten ended up with his sister. The fact that Lauren likes Mia's cooking and her talking about how she did absolutely nothing with her life but train is probably the best example of her own issues in this regard. Of course Mia's cooking tastes good to her. She's probably subsisted on such a simple diet all her life, the same things over and over since childhood to keep her life regimented and disciplined on the task. Tasting anything different like that has gotta be heavenly. And I tried to show clips during the recap that pointed out that she does does think about her father all the time. She's older than Jaden, probably has more memories of their father and what he meant to her. And again, her actress, Kimberly Crossman, absolutely nailed her character in all the best ways. The subtle motions and actions, the unease and sadness that she's obviously carrying with her, and ultimately the disappointment that everything she worked for, everything she sacrificed, was for nothing. I think I felt the worst for her when Mike made an offhand comment, seemingly out of earshot, when he wanted to spar with her. You know Jaden never liked it when you challenged him. She's not Jaden. That look, just for a moment. She wants to be friends with these people. She needs to be friends with them and interact with them. And his reaction is, she's not Jaden. That must have been a spin sword through her damn heart. The hero worship of the others of Jaden was just irritating and grating at the end. Yes, he's your friend, but not a single one of them ever seemed to care about Lauren's feelings and how crappy it must have been for her. But speaking of crappy upbringings... Do you ever take a break? <sighs> Every second that you're not training is a second wasted. I really have to wonder how messed up Kevin's childhood must have been to have that attitude. He had to give up his Olympic dreams to be part of the samurai, abandon his entire life and everything he wanted it to be. He, of all people, should have understood how much this sucks, but it doesn't help that there was obviously a bit of elitism that went into his upbringing too. While the training aspect of Antonio was brought up, Kevin was the one to bring up the lack of familial connection. And even after Antonio had proven himself, he was judgmental of Antonio's skills and talents with digital symbol power. Impressive, but this is the work of a computer nerd, not a samurai. I mean, he's technically correct, but 
Why the hell is there only one method that's okay for fighting evil? He gets over it by the end of the episode, even saying so in a later episode. But that's because he actually did grow as a character thanks to how much he interacted with the others. In fact, earlier on, he lashed out a lot at the others who didn't meet his rigorous standards, probably similar ones placed on him by his dad and possibly his coach. His episodes are about his needlessly strict discipline and commitment, even though we keep seeing others are able to balance this stuff pretty well. In a sticky situation, he claims to have let the team down when he and Mike get stuck together. Any minor failure in his mind is blown up to extreme proportions. Kevin's acting is pretty bad. He always speaks as if he's trying to half whisper whatever he says, and he's got a constant look of confusion on his face. The actor's trying, I can tell, but the poor writing and the lack of direction given to him is what's really hurting his performance. Mia is probably the least developed of the team, and I hate to say it, but I fear she suffered the worst in terms of character if this really was more translation instead of adaptation, since her character really seemed to be about conforming to gender norms. I'd also want to have a normal life. You know, find my Prince Charming someday. Hell, her opening scenes have her playing with children in a daycare, implying her to be all about being a mother, although I could just be reading into that too much, and her running theme is all about being a cook. Her goal early on, however, as shown above, is about getting married. Mike, every girl wants to wear a wedding gown. Maybe me more than others. Ha ha ha! Way to be progressive, Power Rangers! Now, to be fair, these are not wrong in and of themselves. It's okay to like cooking. It's okay to want to get married and have kids and be swept away romantically. The problem is that so much of American culture is already geared towards pushing girls in that direction, and when you have an action-adventure show with women in a prominent role, maybe we should be seeing the guys doing more cooking if they hate her so much. Maybe some of the guys should talk about how they'd love to get married to someone too. Maybe have her express interest in things that are not domestically inclined, which she does once when we learn as a kid she wanted to be part of her brother's band, but this is never referenced again before or afterwards. Although the cooking thing might be more an example of her trying to break away from the samurai lifestyle and have her own thing, even if she can't do it. Unrelated, it's also thanks to Mia when we see her driver's license in an episode that reveals that their city is called Panorama City because it is never said on screen. Her parents show that they hoist expectations on their children by saying her brother, Terry, should go to med school instead of pursuing his aspirations of forming a band. But then Mia's a dick to him about it, saying he should be focused on his med school stuff, care more about large-scale responsibilities and devotion to others. Mike develops the most as a fighter, plus is the only one willing to challenge the others on their lifestyles. I get the impression his family was less pushy when it came to having him devote his time to their responsibilities, or at the very least, he was more willing to question and rebel against it than the others, as we see any time he questions G or Kevin on the lifestyle or anything he disagrees with. However, he's definitely one of the most noble of the group. He was the first one to volunteer to become a Nylock if it meant saving Emily. I'll do it. Emily's the best of us. She has the sweetest, most caring spirit, and I won't let that Nylock keep it. Speaking of, that forced relationship in the ending. Yeah, he expresses concern for her in trading places, but that just came across like genuine concern for a friend and comrade. Aside from the final episodes and the setup in Clash of the Red Rangers, you would never assume they were going to end up together. They didn't seem any more or less friendly than anyone else. And that brings us to Emily and, frankly, the wasted opportunities there. Her older sister Serena was supposed to be the one to become the samurai, but she fell ill and couldn't answer the call. She's the least confident of the team, although she does develop over the course of the series to the point where she's able to talk down Bulk and Spike. Basically, during an episode when Bulk and Spike find the command house and Emily is there, she transforms into a drill sergeant Mako Mori and makes the two do exercise until they leave, being authoritarian and strong around them, which she never would have done back when she started. Plus, it's one of the few times Bulk and Spike are actually clearly on screen with one of the rangers. Most of the times, it could very well be a stunt double either way. But more interesting with her character is in Team Spirit, where she kept apologizing for being a burden on them, for them trying to cover for her and take care of her when her spirit is stolen. And yet still earlier, in Sticks and Stones, she admitted that the monster's insults didn't affect her like the others because she said the same things about herself. It did actually make me wonder if she suffered from depression, although that's probably more complicated than Power Rangers would ever deal with. It was a subtle arc, 
which I think was a problem with a lot of the series. Character change was subtle over time, but didn't take advantage of overt character story opportunities. So here's an idea. Instead of revealing that it was her sister who was supposed to be the ranger right in the second episode, why not save that revelation until halfway through? Then it becomes a confidence and trust issue, especially if Emily reveals that she's been working under a false name or something this entire time. It creates drama in the group, plus a parallel for Jaden's own story, with either him being the only one who supports her when it's revealed, or him looking like a hypocrite to the others when the same thing happens at the end of the season. Nothing is done with it. No drama or introspection of the like. For crying out loud, Lost Galaxy did this better with Mike and Leo. And sometimes it is okay to reuse plot elements in new ways. My problem with RPM reusing the Corone and Andro story was because they didn't really do anything new with it. But in the end, it was something. Here, her replacing her sister is an afterthought. Antonio was self-confidence and flair personified, wanting to make a big splash and prove himself. There was no real big change or arc for the character, and most of the stuff there is to say about him, I've said already, what with the terrible resolution to his trauma, or what an asshole some of his teammates were to him for no good reason. Which brings us, of course, to the true heroes of the franchise. Thanks for taking me in, Uncle Bulk. Dad said that he could help me become something great. And then he laughed for about 20 minutes. Now, the thing is, being a samurai is not really what Bulk is teaching, some exceptions notwithstanding. He's trying to teach Spike in the ways of being a hero, a good person. Not to say that that's not part of a samurai's code of honor, but the way of the warrior was also primarily about loyalty and fealty to a particular master. Not necessarily chivalry and a code of ethics. And let's face it, Bulk and Skull weren't book smart. What they had going for them was an overall good sense of right and wrong. They were bullies in the first season, yeah, but they moved away from that as the seasons rolled in, and you honestly saw them trying to be good people. Hell, you saw flashes of the good people they would become even during the first season. I disagree with those who say that Samurai regressed Bulk's character. Quite the contrary, he's still consistent. There are certainly times when he seems to be acting immature, but every adult has those moments. Sure, he was cowardly at times compared to, say, Countdown to Destruction, where he bravely charged headfirst into battle, but that was when the situation called for it. That was the last stand of humanity. Of course he was going to get a few points of encouragement. This? This is a normal monster attack. He's not trained in proper combat. He just has some gumption. And even then, him being brave when all hope seemed lost does not turn him into a badass for the rest of his life. And while they might still flee from monster attacks, they're also just as dedicated to getting back up and doing the right thing. Let's go find that monster and give him the weapon he deserves! Yeah! <laughs> More often than not, they were used as comedic shtick, and admittedly, not all of their shtick works and it can fall flat. But the same can be true of when it was Bulk and Skull in the old days. The big problem for a lot of their shtick is, sadly, Spike. Basically, he acts like Skull from Season 1 on drugs. He mugs to the camera more than Dax, heaving like a hyperactive five-year-old, despite being at least 17. <laughs> Bedtime story. <laughs> well, did I ever tell you about the time I went into space and helped colonize another planet? Still, we get a lot of amusing bits out of them, like when Bulk thinks their path to success might be through music. Pants, pants, pants. My pants have no pockets. Pockets, pockets. Oh, but the road goes on forever. Not surprising things would go this way. After all, we saw Bulk and Skull's musical talents before. Spike may act like all three stooges merged into one, but his heart is in the right place. When the rent on the shack is due and the two are out of money, he tries to get a job to help with it. But unfortunately, his shtick keeps him from holding said jobs. It's during this when he meets Mia in person, actually falling for her when she offers encouragement, which of course doesn't lead to anything in terms of a relationship, but it does ultimately lead to them discovering the command house and realize it's a samurai temple. More on that in a bit, but here's the thing I should really point out again. The two are still heroes. As I've said before, the test of heroism is about doing what you can even while you don't possess anything special. During Stroke of Fate, the two encounter one of the wedges shooting out energy like a geyser and decide they have to block it up. They create a giant bubblegum ball, just roll with it, like them, 
or they try to use it to block up the hole. Mind you, it closes before they reach it, although they don't see that, but it could very well have worked, and hey, they made the effort of trying to save the day in spite of the risks to themselves. Their journey has all about becoming true samurai, so all that remains is vindication of that from an official source, which they get in a bit of an unusual way. See, as you may or may not have noticed, Samurai did not have traditional season requisite clip shows. It had three clip shows aired as holiday specials, a Halloween one and two Christmas ones. During the second Christmas clip show episode, the two end up stuck with Mentor G in the command house, like I said, they had earlier discovered his location, and share stories with him about trying to help the rangers and whatnot. G asks the rangers, who had become trapped in the Megazord after a battle, to come in and give that vindication. We came by to thank you for all your hard work helping us save our world from evil. Their journey at that point was complete. Bulk and Spike got what they needed, validation that they had done good in the world, even if they weren't always funny or intelligent while doing so. And hey, apparently Skull got rich, so I think everything worked out in the end. As I said back for In Space, not bad for the two who once got trapped in recycling bins. Spike, I ever tell you about the time your dad and I adopted a pig that turned out to be a monster? Overall, Samurai is a flawed but watchable series. While it was not the massive success that the original Mighty Morphin was, it was fairly popular with its target demographic, aka little kids. And in some ways, that's what's important in the grand scheme of things. Ratings were back up to an acceptable level, especially since RPM had sadly done so badly due to a lack of promotion and an abysmal time slot from Disney. With two years of a series that originally had to be rushed to completion now over with, and the 20th anniversary of the show in sight, Power Rangers was poised to do things properly for their next season and put forth the best they had available. Come back this Christmas as we take a look at their efforts and sadly, the disappointing failure of those efforts in Power Rangers Megaforce. What can I say? I buy in bulk. <laughs> Spike? It's two in time! 